The Super Mario Brothers movie is perfect for kids, casual Nintendo fans, and people who want to go, DUDE! DUDE! THAT'S MARIO! And as someone in that third category, this movie felt handcrafted just for me. The number of references from In Your Face to Blink and You Miss It moments, this movie just has so much love for everything Nintendo. And that makes it the perfect movie for me, the guy who tells you all about insignificant references you don't really care about. So for the sake of this video, I'm not going to point out the obvious stuff in the movie. Like, did you know that this is a Goomba? It would just waste time on information that everyone already knows. I want to dive into the backgrounds, the little moments, even a few musical cues, and just point out references or inspiration for this film. So let's jump in to the Super Mario Bros. movie. Starting out, we see Bowser's flying fortress attacking the Snow Kingdom. While this fortress was definitely designed with unique movie elements in it, there have been multiple instances of Bowser having flying castles or fortresses in the games, so the creators of the movie had a myriad of options to take note of. Jumping ahead to the Super Mario Bros. commercial, the first thing right away is the song. This Mario Bros. rap served as the intro for the TV show in the late 80s, the Super Mario Bros. Super Show. The rap uses the ground theme from the first Super Mario Bros. as the backing track, and while while the movie version would technically be a cover of the TV intro, the lyrics they use are exactly the same. Oh, we're the Mario Brothers in plumbing's a game. We're not like the others who get all the fame. If your sick is in trouble, you can call us on the double. We're faster than the others, you'll be hooked on the brothers. It's just such an obscure thing from the earliest days of Mario's life, it's just so cool that they included it in the modern era. Visuals from the commercial also have some references. The Super Mario Bros. plumbing logo is ripped directly from the new Super Mario Bros. logo, just erasing the new in the corner. The art of Mario next to the logo also feels like the 2D style that we often see in promotional material from Nintendo. In the shot of Mario and Luigi in front of the New York skyline, we can see them wearing capes. While the actual power-up doesn't make an appearance in the movie, these capes are clearly meant to reference the feather and cape power-up from Super Mario World on the SNES. On the map, we can see quite a few names of streets or locations hidden in plain sight. Mushroom Planet is obvious, but also Punch-Out and Burger Castle, which are references we'll talk about in a minute. Both Luck Card Street and Hanafuda Street are based on Nintendo's origins of creating Hanafuda playing cards. 1889th Street is also significant, coming from the year Nintendo was founded. There's also Link Street for Link, and Mansion Street for Luigi's Mansion. After the commercial, we are properly introduced to the Mario Brothers inside a pizzeria, and we get a ton of angles and shots of this place. This is called Punch-Out Pizzeria based on the boxing series by Nintendo. While this game actually debuted on arcade systems and then would be on some of the retro Nintendo consoles, nearly all of the art on the walls comes from the Punch-Out! reboot that was released for the Wii. We can see Little Mac and Doc Lewis, a shot from the famous bicycle training sequences in the NES Punch-Out!, a ton of the boxers Little Mac takes on. In different angles, we can also see Little Mac's gloves, shorts, and championship belt proudly displayed. Now outside of all the Punch-Out! references, we can also see the duck from Duck Hunt, as well as a picture of the main backdrop from that game. And just below that, we can see a small flag, clearly modeled after the flags for Mario. And of course, we have to talk about the cameo for the game voice of Mario, Charles Martinet. In the commercial, Mario and Luigi were both doing voices similar to their game incarnations, though we quickly learned that that was just for the commercial, and the rest of the movie gives them more toned down voices. But we learned that their inspiration for the voices was a guy named Giuseppe, who tells them, It's a perfect! Wahoo! Clearly Charles Martinet doing his Mario game voice. His character was also designed to be similar to Jumpman's original appearance in Donkey Kong. Obviously there were liberties taken, but overall the reference still stands. And speaking of Jumpman, we can see that Giuseppe was playing an arcade cabinet. On first glance, this appears to be Donkey Kong. However, for the sake of the movie, this has been changed to a game called Jumpman, the name Mario was originally given in Donkey Kong. DK himself is no longer in the game, being replaced with some big yeti-looking creature, and Jumpman's design has also been altered. Obviously, this was included as a nod to both Mario and DK's roots together, but the changes were made because Mario and Donkey Kong are actual guys in the movie's universe, so having them appear in the game as well wouldn't really make sense. Before we jump ahead, we have to take a look at the news. Multiple times throughout the movie, we get fun easter eggs through the use of a news program, and we'll address those as they show up. After the Mario Brothers plumbing commercial, we get a big headline about the mayoral race, and Pauline being newly elected mayor of New York City. Not only is this a nod to the character Pauline, her being mayor is from Super Mario Odyssey, though in that game she was mayor of New Donk City, which is a fictional city inspired by New York City, so it all kind of loops back around on itself. 
The ticker at the bottom also features some smaller headlines. Stolen vegetables recovered by the Ice Climbers, based on the Ice Climber game for NES and the numerous vegetables that appear there. And after that, a report about a disturbance near Hogan's Alley, another NES game. And the little news logo in the bottom corner comes from the Mario Kart TV icon in Mario Kart 8. With the news out of the way, we finally meet Spike, the foreman from Wrecking Crew, who in this incarnation is literally the foreman for a business called The Wrecking Crew. Luigi's phone rings and we can hear that it's the GameCube boot-up sequence sound effects. When he picks up the phone, we can see that the silhouette for the unknown caller is based on one of the default Miis from Nintendo consoles. After their work truck dies on them, we can see the Super Sunshine Travel Agency next door to Punch-Out Pizzeria, which is clearly based on Super Mario Sunshine's logo, and it includes dolphins, which is the shape of Isle Delfino. Their license plate also says Mario Bro. They are really dedicated to that branding. As they run past the fruit stand, we can see a city bike store, which has the sprite from Excite Bike on it. The local paper seems to be called the Daily 8-Bit, a nod to the Nintendo Entertainment System being an 8-bit game console. The headline also seems to say, The Mustache is Back, which is good news for our mustachioed brothers. The truck in the background has a little Game & Watch guy on it, and there's also one on a construction sign later on. And now we get the famous side-scrolling segment, which everybody seemed to notice. This segment loosely recreates the layout of World 1-1 from Super Mario Bros., but in the context of a construction yard. We can see brick and question mark block stand-ins, a variety of objects filling in for the pipes, and even a gap that Mario needs to jump over. Mario hops onto a beam that looks pretty similar to the ones from Donkey Kong, and then he finishes off the level by climbing up a staircase and jumping to a pole, just like the games. A restaurant called Castle Burger is even at the end, referencing the castles at the end of levels. And when Mario slides down, the same sound effect from Super Mario Bros. plays. In the rich couple's house, we can immediately hear an easy listening cover of the overworld theme from Super Mario Bros. 3. We can also see a bunch of fancy modern art on the walls. These pieces in particular are based on tiles found in Super Mario Bros. 3. There's also a painting of the dog from Duck Hunt laughing in the background. The husband is later seen reading a book with Galaxy in the title, with an image of what appears to be some kind of planet based on Super Mario Galaxy. We can also see a glass Pikmin just to the right of him. Back at the Mario household, we get the first ever look at Mario's family. Mario's dad may look a little familiar, looking eerily similar to Talon from The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Apparently, the designs for the brothers' mom and dad were provided by Nintendo themselves, so it's not exactly a Talon reference. However, since Talon himself was meant to be a reference to Mario, it's possible that this previously unseen design for their dad was the inspiration for Talon's design. Charles Martinet also voices their dad here, giving him a bit more of a role than just the sole Giuseppe cameo. Yahoo! Their Uncle Tony here is also not entirely new. While he's never made an appearance before now, the Super Mario Bros. Super Show sees the brothers mentioning an Uncle Tony in an offhand comment. Mario then mentions that their white gloves allow them to stand out, which is in fact literally the reason that they were given white gloves during their initial design. Their sprites stood out, allowing the player to keep track of them more easily. The decor also has a couple of references. There's a photo of Mario in his outfit from Mario Tennis Aces. There are also some of these sheep that wear sombreros found in Super Mario Odyssey. And Mario and Luigi's room here is an absolute gold mine filled with little easter eggs that we gotta talk about. First is the obvious. Mario's playing Kid Icarus on his NES, with a couple of NES cartridges lying around too. There's also a figure of an R-Wing from Star Fox right on the TV as well. But then there's just a ton of not-so-obvious stuff peppered throughout. We have a baseball and tennis racket, both based on the various baseball and tennis spin-offs in the Mario series. Mario has the book of the Odyssey by Homer on his shelf, which is a nod to Super Mario Odyssey. And then we have a ton of NES game references. The VWA poster is from Pro Wrestling, with VWA standing for Video Wrestling Association. The two fighters on the poster are Starman and the Amazon, both playable characters in that game. There's also references to tennis, golf, Track and Field, Excite Bike, F Zero, The Polar Bear from Ice Climber, Kung Fu, and Baseball. In this tiny text up here, we can kind of make out the words Slugger Mate versus Ultra Hand, an Easter egg to a toy produced by Nintendo in the 60s and a peripheral to the NES. When Mario switches to the news, we see a couple more headlines on the ticker. Authorities investigating reports of underground crab sightings comes from the Mario Brothers arcade game, in which Mario and Luigi fight crabs down in the sewers. A signal detected in Star System FS1. Which is the star system that planet Zebus is located in in the Metroid series. Our Hayami wins Wave Race Championship despite average stats, 
Our Hayami is Ryota Hayami, the main character of Wave Race 64, who does indeed have only average stats. We also properly see Mayor Pauline this time, who's dressed in similar colors to her appearance in Super Mario Odyssey. Next, there's a restaurant which clearly has the duck from Duck Hunt on its sign. However, the French name also literally translates to duck hunting, which is a nice little reference. When Mario and Luigi slam through the wall in the sewers, the hole they make is in the shape of 8-bit Mario's head, which completely went over my head in the theaters. This whole area that they explore is also a parallel to the warp zones from Super Mario Bros. The area is labeled as 1-2 on this sign, we can hear bits of the underground jingle, they go through a pipe that ends up taking them to another world. Heck, the whole area is blocked off by a giant brick wall, just like in the real 1-2. As they both fall into the Mushroom Kingdom, the magical cloud area between these worlds seems sort of reminiscent of the opening to Super Mario 3D World, though obviously cranked up to 11 for the sake of the movie. And now we're finally in the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario meets Toad, and while he's never called it by name, this is clearly meant to be the movie stand-in for Captain Toad, with the big backpack and his sense of adventure. Speaking of his backpack, it has a few pins on it, one of Peach's castle, one of the Sand Kingdom's inverted pyramid, and one of the Cascade kingdom with its T-Rex. As Mario and Toad head to the castle, we get the most indirect Luigi's Mansion reference ever. The way Luigi calls for Mario, Mario, him using the flashlight, and just being surrounded and chased by enemies are all very Luigi's Mansion vibes, though there isn't a mansion or a ghost in sight. But we do get the tiniest hint of the Luigi's Mansion theme. Where are you? Huh? I guess that'll just have to do until that Luigi's Mansion solo movie, huh? Back with Mario and Toad, we finally hit the Mushroom Kingdom, and man, there is so much to soak in. First, we can see some bell-shaped trees, sort of like the one seen in Super Mario 3D World. These toads are using what seems to be an ATM for coins, of course complete with a coin block to jump into. Just above are the chests found in the toad houses in Super Mario Bros. 3. Right here, we can see Crazy Cap, the clothing store that sells different outfits in Super Mario Odyssey. Captain Toad calls out to a toad named Chantrell, who responds, Morning. Nice to see you, bud. This is clearly the voice actor for the actual toads in the games. Chantrell is also a reference, being the name of a toad from Paper Mario, and she gets her name from a species of real-life mushrooms. The only reference to Toadette in the entire movie is right here on this banner, along with two other toads who appear to be in some kind of band. This banner's border is also a reference, based on the title screen from Super Mario Bros. 2. And then we've got the antique store, which is packed full of stuff to look at. Pretty much all of these items are in a sort of old sprite-based appearance, which is appropriate for an antique store. There's a hammer from a hammer bro, the music box, and the anchor item, all of which are from Super Mario Bros. 3. You can also see the P-Wing item, also from Mario 3, in a slightly different angle. There's also the dragon coin, exclamation block, P-Balloon, and key items from Super Mario World. There's a potion from Super Mario Bros. 2, and from Super Mario Bros. 1, there's Lakitu's Cloud, and the axe that appears at the end of Bowser levels. There's also, for some reason, reason, a sprite-based version of the Super Bell from 3D World, which is odd because it's never had this appearance before now. In the background, we can see a poster of Peach as she appears in the letters found in Super Mario Bros. 3. And finally, we can hear the salesman talking about making an NES cartridge work by blowing into it, which was famously the common solution if the game wouldn't turn on properly. It's actually pretty ironic that this is in the movie, because Nintendo's own advice was to not do this since it technically does more harm than good. All right, that's one of the heavy reference sections out of the way. Moving on, we can see these construction worker toads are dressed exactly as they appear in Super Mario Maker. Neat. Now up to this point, you may have noticed different Mario items peppered around the town, like mushrooms and flowers. These actually aren't randomly placed. From what I can tell, these seem to be kind of like a train system. Here we can see a Mario 3 style map, which seems to work kind of like a train map, but instead for their system of pipes and lifts. Instead of taking red line to blue line, for example, you take red mushroom, then switch to blue flower. We can also see a map of the kingdom here, which sort of matches up with this theory, with different power-ups and colors scattered throughout. This map is also vaguely in the style of Super Mario World's map. Mario also runs here, just like he does in Super Mario 3D World. The two then jump into a clear pipe, also pulled straight from 3D World, and now we finally get to Peach's Castle, which is mostly based on its appearance from Super Mario Odyssey, but of course with their own illumination touch. We get the classic, A princess though is in another castle, which is exactly what the toads in each castle would say at the end of a world in Super Mario Bros. These two guard toads are also the blue and yellow toads, which could be a coincidence, as these are both the colors of the playable toads in the new Super 
Super Mario Bros. series. Toad then feeds the guards, possibly inspired by the cooking cutscenes found in Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. Throughout Peach's castle, we can see a ton of large paintings. These were very likely inspired by the paintings Mario jumps into in Super Mario 64, but none of the movie paintings actually reference these specifically. We also get an unbelievably small sound effect reference. When Mario skids on the floor, we hear the quickest snippet of the P-Speed sound from Super Mario Bros. 3. <laughs> Jumping to the Council of Toads meeting, when the voxel-like map of the world generates, the sound effect that plays is the same one that plays in Mario 3 when Mario spawns into a world. We can also get a small glimpse of surrounding areas to the Mushroom Kingdom. The Snow Kingdom and Dark Lands we already know about, and we can also see the Jungle Kingdom, Yoshi's Island, and the Sand Kingdom from Mario Odyssey. And now I just cut a vent for a second. I am such a hater for this Toad specifically, and honestly it's not even his fault. He was clearly meant to be a stand-in for Toadsworth, with the glasses, bow tie, and being a high-ranking Toad that serves the princess. Why didn't they just make him Toadsworth? That guy rules! As Mario and Peach head to the obstacle course, we can see that these decorative mushrooms actually bear quite the resemblance to the Super Crown, the power-up that turns Toadette into Peachette, which is also responsible for the existence of Bowsette, so let's just, let's just move on. The obstacle course has a ton of pretty obvious references, like the mechanical piranha plants, rotating blocks from Super Mario World, and donut blocks, just to name a few. A couple of smaller ones are these rotating rods, which are based on the fire bars that first appeared in Mario 1. At the end of Peach's run-through of the course, her dress poofs out and she does her iconic float, which first appeared in Mario 2. During Mario's almost successful run of the course, we see a few iconic Mario moves in action. First, he does a dive, one of his common moves in the 3D platformers. Then, of course, a ground pound. After that, we get to see his forward aerial from Smash Brothers. As he runs towards the bullet bills, he holds his arms out just as he does when he hits P-Speed in Mario 3. Jumping ahead to the big party on Bowser's castle, a Koopa metal band is performing the Bowser's Fury theme from Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury, which is kind of wild considering that song is like almost brand new. We also we also literally watched the murder of a Koopa into a Dry Bones, which is not something that I was expecting going into this movie. Next, Luigi gets carted off to Bowser, and we see some bats that are actually from Super Mario Galaxy. The balloon that the Shy Guys take him in is also shaped just like their bodies, with that weird sort of tail thing on the top. And we then get a flashback of Baby Mario and Luigi, who are not only super adorable, but totally faithful to the way that they appear in the games. The little flag that Baby Luigi's holding is also pulled straight out of Mario 1, too. This song that the Toads play to herald the princess's arrival is the Mario 1 level clear theme. And now we get the awesome travel montage as the group heads to the Jungle Kingdom. First, we see Bob on Battlefield from Mario 64, complete with the cannon and that small floating island over there. Then we see the Cheap Cheap Bridge, the level design used in World 2-3 and Mario 1. After that, the Sand Kingdom of Super Mario Odyssey, featuring the Great Upside Down Pyramid. We can also see the Stone Eye enemies here, which are actually featured in desert levels in the new Super Mario Bros. series rather than Odyssey, so that's kind of a fun touch. And then we get a glimpse of Yoshi's Island. These Yoshis all running in a stampede is possibly a nod to Super Smash Bros. in both the intro to Melee and Yoshi's most recent Final Smash in Ultimate. One thing I actually noticed looking at this swarm of Yoshis is that none of them are actually green. We get pretty much every other color of Yoshi here, but green is totally missing, and I'll talk about that more later. Mario also gets a yummy Yoshi fruit as a treat. And finally, we see a sort of cloudy, mountainous sky area, which is possibly a combination of the Sky World levels and mountain levels from the new Super Mario Bros. series. The piano Bowser plays has the name Ludwig von Koopa on it, which is a sort of double reference. Of course, it's a nod to the Koopaling. However, Ludwig von Koopa was named after Ludwig von Beethoven, the famous pianist and composer, so putting that name on the piano all kind of loops back around to Von Koopa's origin. When Kamek joins Bowser at the piano, Bowser plays the underground theme from Super Mario Bros., and Kamek tosses in the coin, power-up, and one-up sound effects. During this gorgeous scene in the Fire Flower Field, we see Peach become Fire Peach using her design from Super Mario 3D World, which is itself based on her original NES sprite. We also get a brief info dump on her life up to this point. She found herself in the Mushroom Kingdom as a baby, using a design inspired by her appearance in the Mario games. We then get a little montage of her growing up, and one of the coolest things is this shot of her as a teenager at the obstacle course. We don't see her in her usual pink dress, we actually see her in clothing that the Toads normally wear, 
but actually made for someone her size, which is a really cute detail. She also mentions lots of galaxies, which is an obvious allusion to Mario Galaxy. At the end of this scene, Toad is seen playing a recorder, which could come from the appearance of the warp whistle from Mario 3. During this prison scene, we finally get to see Luma Lee, a captured Luma who somehow makes prison even more depressing than it already is. When he blows on the little pinwheel, we can hear the Luma giggle sound effect ripped straight from the games. The cages that all of these prisoners are in also bear resemblance to the cage where Peach is imprisoned in New Super Mario Bros. Wii. Mario, Peach, and Toad finally make it to the Jungle Kingdom, where they meet the Guard Kong in a sports coat. The front of his cart has a rhino symbol for Rambi the Rhino, one of the animal buddies in Donkey Kong Country. As they drive through this area, we get a pretty good look at the Jungle Kingdom, and overall this area is pretty heavily inspired by designs used in Donkey Kong Country Returns rather than the older Super Nintendo games. We can also see some support beams here and there, again taken from the original arcade game. The Kong that's driving the cart literally kills another Kong by throwing a banana peel behind him, making him spin out. However, what you may have missed is that this Kong is actually Swanky Kong, wearing similar drip to his appearance in Donkey Kong Country 3. The entrance to the throne room that the group glides into is the Golden Temple, the final level from Donkey Kong Country Returns. And now let's jump to the Great Ring of Kong. Scattered throughout the ring are more of the red DK arcade beams, however here we also see the blue ladders that Mario could climb up. This Kong here also has a 64 on his shirt for Donkey Kong 64, and these Kongs are holding up a scarf with Donkey Kong's arcade sprite and Diddy stars. When Donkey Kong officially makes his appearance, the DK rap from Donkey Kong 64 plays in the background, and DK sings along to it, showboating a bit for the crowd. DK. I'm Donkey Kong. We then get a funny bit of Diddy Kong getting scolded for cheering too long for DK, and we can also see Dixie Kong and, of all characters, Chunky Kong for some reason as well. Fun little cameo of the wider Kong family, and maybe a glimpse at a future Donkey Kong movie. Eh, come on Nintendo, you know you want to. To start off the fight, Mario sorta does the windup of his forward aerial from Smash Bros, but DK stops that. It is on like Donkey Kong! Is a crazy full circle moment. The phrase first appeared in Ice Cube's song, Now I Gotta Wetcha, but Nintendo would go on to copyright the phrase in 2010 without ever really using it for anything. So hearing Seth Rogen's DK say it in the movies is just so funny. Mario does a slide under DK, kinda like a move that he can do in Mario 64, and then he grabs and eats a mini mushroom. This particular shot of DK looking down and attacking a small Mario is actually pulled from a deep cut, the final boss fight of the Game Boy title Donkey Kong 94. DK then does his roll move from Donkey Kong Country. Throwing a barrel down from above is an obvious nod to him throwing barrels down in the arcade game as well. He then does a big clap attack, which has got to be taken from his forward smash attack in Smash Bros. Aw, it's the cat suit from Super Mario 3D World. Kind of funny that we don't even see the bell, we just see the actual suit, but it is what it is. Seth Rogen then gets his butt kicked by Cat Chris Pratt and ends up super punch drunk. When he's flailing around, we can hear the intro jingle to the arcade Donkey Kong play. Not even close. <laughs> Diddy Kong also plays the DK bongos while everyone is cheering on Mario, which is a cute nod to that era of DK games. After the fight, the group hangs out at Donkey Kong's hut, the design of which is based on the hut's appearance in Donkey Kong Country Returns. In this particular angle, we also see a rocking chair, which is presumably Cranky Kong's, where he can often be seen sitting and complaining in the country games. The group heads inside to discuss their plans, and we see some fun Easter eggs on DK's walls. First is a picture of both Donkey Kong and Funky Kong surfing. Then there's a picture of Donkey Kong's silhouette at sunset, which is very obviously taken from the famous level in Donkey Kong Country Returns, Sunset Shore. There's also some kind of picture of a Kong in a cart with the number 98, but we don't ever get a clear view of this. The map that the group consults perfectly emulates the style of the world map from Super Mario World, though it uses elements and locations that are found in the movie's version of the universe. The symbol that indicates north on the map has the N inside of a spade symbol, which is pulled directly from the card minigame found in Super Mario Bros. 3. As the scene changes to the cart garage, the background music that plays is a cover of the cart select theme from Mario Kart 8 and Deluxe. This Kong also has a 64 on his shoulder plate, again referencing DK64. Mario, Peach, and Toad head over to pick out their carts. They spin a physical machine to select their body, wheels, and gliders, which is pulled directly out of the way that you customize your cart in Mario Kart 8. The noise when they spin it is even the item box roulette sound effect.
we can see quite a few vehicle options that are actually found in Mario Kart. There's the Biddy Buggy, Standard Bike, and Pipe Frame Karts, the Standard Tires, Cyber Slicks, and Slim Tires, and the Standard and Parachute Gliders. And to round it all off, they even press an A button to confirm their choice, though theirs isn't on a controller and it's also enormous. The kart that Mario ultimately picks is kind of an original design inspired by the standard karts across all of the Mario Kart games. It sort of hits the same beats, but they give it their own twist. Peach chooses what's essentially the mock bike, and they likely chose this for her because it appears in key art from Mario Kart Wii. She also changes into her race suit, which she wears while driving a bike in the Mario Kart series. Toad also gets a semi-original design, being inspired by the Tiny Titan vehicle, though it definitely takes its liberties. When Bowser practices his proposal to Peach, he puts on the very same top hat that he wears in Odyssey. The bouquet of piranha plant flowers that he holds is also pulled straight from that game as well. Kamek dresses as Peach for the little rehearsal, which is actually something that's appeared in the games, in both New Super Mario Bros. Wii and Mario & Luigi Dream Team. Jumping back to the Mario gang, they're all headed to the Kong's secret shortcut. They have to launch off of a ramp, and the end of it looks just like a boost panel from Mario Kart, though here it just seems to be painted that way and doesn't actually have a boost function. And then of course, the secret passage is ultimately revealed to be Rainbow Road. When the big reveal happens, an angelic choir sings a snippet from the SNES Rainbow Road theme. We also get the absolutely tiniest of glimpses at two more Kongs. On the left, we have Kitty Kong, Dixie sidekick from Donkey Kong Country 3. And here we have who appears to be Funky Kong, complete with his cool shades and bandana. And now with the attack from the Koopa Troop, we get some amazing Mario Kart action. I won't dive too deep into it because most of it's pretty obvious, but we of course see some iconic item play. Throwing shells, bob bananas, and even launching bullet bills. Mario even does some sick drifting to charge some mini turbos, going all the way up to the pink sparks that were introduced in Mario Kart 8. The way that he performs these quickly could even be seen as snaking, the technique of chaining drifts together to maintain a higher speed than normal. If that was the intention, that's just a crazy easter egg. Mario dries off the side of the track and lands on a track lower. I would not at all be surprised if this was inspired by the famous shortcut used in Mario Kart 64's Rainbow Road. I mean, some of these references are deep cuts, so something like this, it just wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Did you guys catch it? The reference? He, he's the blue shell! I honestly, I would have missed it if he hadn't said it. When the Kongs are trapped because of the blue shell destroying the road, the Koopa Troop capture them using Bowser's clown cars, which were first introduced in Super Mario World, but now are usually used by Bowser Jr. and the Koopalings. And ending off this sequence, Mario and DK are swallowed by Unagi, the giant eel that first appeared in Super Mario 64. Peach races into the Mushroom Kingdom to warn the Toads that Bowser's on his way, and we get a couple of new angles where we can see some additional details. First, we can see what appears to be a fish store, with some Mario fish enemies on the sign. That's probably where this Toad from earlier actually bought his new pet Cheep Cheep. This hardware store here seems to sell both boomerang power-ups and POW blocks. These apples? Well, I think they're just apples. But they still have the same pattern that Yoshi fruits have, they're just way smaller. Jumping back to Mario and DK inside of Unagi, they realize that they still have a rocket left and they use it to blast out of its mouth. This rocket, and the way that they ride it, are both taken directly from the rocket barrel sections in Donkey Kong Country Returns, except instead of Mario, it's usually Diddy Kong next to DK. The cake topper for Peach and Bowser's wedding cake is definitely directly inspired by Odyssey. The guests for the wedding are all enemies in the Koopa Troop, but we also have some cool notable bosses as well, King bob and King Boo. When King bob sits down, he actually hits a Koopa, which makes it go into its shell and bounce back and forth just like a shell would in the games, which genuinely had me bust out laughing in the theater. A couple guests drop some wedding gifts on the gift table, and one of those is clearly a Yoshi egg, which, again, we'll talk about in a bit. Looking at Peach's wedding dress, we see that it has some shades of pink at the bottom, and honestly, the first thing I thought of was this alternate color that Daisy has in Super Smash Bros. I don't know if that was intended or if it was just a coincidence, but the resemblance is really close. Next, we see Peach pull out an ice flower and activate it, turning her basically into Elsa. What's pretty cool is that this design for Peach is completely original to the movie. She's never been playable in a Mario game that also features the ice flower as a power-up. The same is actually true for Frosted Tip Fire Donkey Kong here, since DK has never used a power-up like this before. Mario does his P-Speed pose once again, followed up by his Mario 64 dash kick move. When he jumps on this mushroom, we see him do the little propeller spin that he first did in Mario 64 as well. He briefly hits a very Mario 1 jump pose before slamming down into a ground pound. 
Mario then rides very briefly on a shell, which is something he's able to do in Super Mario 64. In the background, Donkey Kong pretty much does his up special from Super Smash Bros., which I absolutely love to see. When Mario kicks the shell forward and it comes flying back to hit him, that really gives me vibes of running behind a shell in a Mario game and it bouncing off a wall and hitting you unexpectedly. But maybe that's also just a stretch. Next, we get the adorable Tanuki Suit Mario, which Mario gets by picking up the Super Leaf power-up. He also uses the signature tailspin attack multiple times while he's wearing the suit. Bowser then gets super mad at Mario, and we actually get to hear a roar taken straight from the games while he blasts his fire breath. He then has a bomber bill launch itself at Peach's Castle, which is eerily similar to what happens on the Peach's Castle stage from Super Smash Bros. Mario then, for some reason, reroutes the bomber bill to the pipe that led to his own home. I, I, I just, I don't know why he did that. All right, so passing over that, we're back in Brooklyn, and with some new angles, we can see some more little Easter eggs. On this car wash sign, we can see the Balloon Fighter from Balloon Fight for the NES. Blizzard Pop Ice Cream also has the Polar Bear from Ice Climber on its sign. This drugstore has some of Dr. Mario's Mega Vitamins on its sign, too. This hardware store has Discoon on it. Discoon was the mascot for the Famicom Disk System, a hardware expansion for the Famicom that never released outside of Japan. And lastly, we see Gyro Market, with a Rob in the center of the logo, inspired by the game Gyromite, one of the two games that released for the Rob peripheral on the NES. This playing card on the side of the building is a reference to Nintendo's roots as a manufacturer of playing cards. In a later shot, we can make out the text clearer, and the card says Hanafuda Company, again, the specific specific style of playing card that Nintendo created. The sign on this taxi also gets shattered to just read Save the Kingdom, as in Mario needing to save the Mushroom Kingdom. As Mario gets a beat down from Bowser, he gets blasted into Punch-Out Pizzeria by Bowser's tail, an attack that's taken directly from the boss fights in Super Mario Odyssey. There's also a neon sign right here that says Soda Popinski, a reference to one of the enemy boxers found in Punch-Out. When the rest of the gang fights Bowser, he does yet another roar from the games. And then we get probably the coolest sequence in the entire movie. Mario and Luigi grab the superstar, glow like the rainbow, and of course, the superstar theme plays in the background. Here we see both Mario and Luigi running in the peace speed pose before they destroy all of these enemies. During this slow-mo jump moment, the sound effect that plays is actually the sound of a shine sprite taken from Super Mario Sunshine. Mario and Luigi launch Bowser up into the sky by spinning him around with his tail, a move obviously taken out of the Bowser fights in Super Mario 64. And of course, they blast into the air and spike Bowser down just like in Smash Bros using Mario's forward aerial. Bowser gets forced to eat a mini mushroom and... <sighs> he gets put into a jar. This is actually taken from Super Mario 3D World's ending, where Bowser can be seen stuck in a jar during the game's credits. And that's all, everyone. Don't talk about it anymore. Donkey Kong does his peck dance here, which is funny because he actually talks about it earlier with Cranky Kong. Make your pecs dance, you deserve it! No time now, definitely later! Well, it's later, so now he does the dance. On this freeze frame, Mario and Luigi are in their iconic jump up pose that is often used in key art for them in their games. And that is the end of the movie. But of course we've got the post credit scene, which I said I was gonna talk about. So earlier we saw all of those Yoshis running, and I said that I didn't see any green ones. But then we see the egg on the gift table, and again in this post credit scene, so that's clearly a green Yoshi. I think there's probably something special about green Yoshis in this version of the Mario universe, which would explain why someone would give it as a special wedding gift. From the movie making perspective, they obviously need something to differentiate the main Yoshi from just any other Yoshi, so making green a special color does that easily. Kinda like how they need to differentiate our main toad from just any random toad, so they gave him the backpack and gear. Obviously this special green Yoshi is gonna play a role in the sequel, which is why it's in the post credit scene, but I just wanted to mention my small theory here about the color. But with that, we have every reference in the Super Mario Brothers movie. Like I said, this movie is an Easter egg hunter's dream. There's just so much packed into it, and you can tell the creators were some of the biggest Mario fans on the planet. If you guys think I missed something, please don't hesitate to let me know down in the comments, or just say hey and let me know what your favorite Easter egg in the movie was. Thank you guys so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace out, have a good day, and please remember to be good to one another.